Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I just want to echo that, and I'm going to come back to that during the, the, the lecture. But yeah, I'm really grateful. Uh, you know, I decided to move here five years ago with my family, uh, and it wasn't an easy decision. Um, again, I love Columbus, Ohio. I love Ohio State. I still love them. I think they have a great football team. But uh, the, uh, you know, it's been a great decision. And uh, again, all of you make it possible uh, to do what we're doing. Uh, and a lot of time you guys are in the shadow of what we're doing, but I could tell you what we're doing is nothing. Uh, it's just sometimes, you know, get the glory and all that is the chair in the Sunday. But at the end of the day, what really matters is all of you guys. And I really mean it and we all mean it because you make the difference. And we're just uh, fortunate to be part of this team. Uh, I have nothing pertinent uh, to this presentation to disclose other than I'm uh, French Canadian, and that's why I have this, this accent. But recently I got naturalized, so I'm not American. So I think it's my first lecture as an American. Thank you. So uh, this is the team. I point about this, I mention about this, and obviously this is just part of the team. Uh, uh, everyone in the hospital, including the genitorial team and all that, I mean, everyone has an impact. A smile here and there could make a huge difference for the patient, for their family. So again, really, really important. Now, cerebrovascular disease, as Wendy pointed out, the treatment of that, the paradigm has changed quite a bit over the last uh, decade. In fact, since I started training in the 90s versus now, a lot of things we're doing were not even available. There's still two tools, I would say. Uh, one is the, the knife uh, and the microscope. Uh, but more and more, the endovascular therapy is the main way to treat most of those uh, lesions. If we look at the evolution, it's amazing. Because if you look in medicine, for example, if you have appendicitis uh, now, the treatment is not that different than if you would have show up you know, 50, 50 years ago as far as the technical aspect of it. If we look at endovascular therapy, in 1930, uh, Edgar Moniz uh, was the first one to do an angiogram. So it was the first one to directly stick a needle in the carotid of someone and inject contrast. And interestingly, an in initial, initial paper showing that it was feasible, eight of 10 patients die from stroke or direct complication of the procedure. So obviously 80% morbidity and mortality for an angiogram in 1930 versus where we are now, while you know, an angiogram has barely a third of 1% risk, it's amazing the changes that have happened during this time. If we look in the 1990s, one of the things that has changed quite a bit is the uh, evolution of the coil. So basically what happens, we had a device now that we could put within the, the brain, within a vessel, and if we we're not happy with the positioning, we could pull it back. So we had a way to detach the coil instead of just throwing something in, in the vessel, hoping for the best. And obviously over the last uh, decade, uh, treatment for thrombectomy and stroke has you know, dramatically evolved. And you know, endovascular therapy, which until the, the mid 90s, 2000, was mostly towards brain aneurysm, now has completely shifted. And most of the procedure we're doing are regarding uh, stroke. This is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is a scan without contrast. So you could see here, all the white here does not belong there. So someone that if has no history of trauma, the most frequent cause is a rupture brain aneurysm. You could see here, an aneurysm, what it is, a bulging in the artery, and then it bleed. And unfortunately here, the outcome was uh, bad on this patient. You could see all the blood at the undersurface of the brain. Now, this is quite a bad disease. 40% of people will die. Uh, it's more frequent in women. Uh, there's about 40,000 patients in the United States every year that are going to bleed from a brain aneurysm. People who sustain a brain aneurysm and survive, a lot of time their life has changed forever. Uh, most of them won't go back to work. A lot of them won't uh, get back to the kind of life they had before. Uh, so, um, uh, and and the uh, a lot of them, uh, and, and the majority of people who have brain aneurysm are you know, between 50 and 60 year of age, but any patient could have brain aneurysm, including a children to a uh, uh, elderly. What could we do to prevent that? The reality is most of the time brain aneurysm, uh, there's nothing we could do really to prevent that other than smoking. And there's factor that could contribute to increase the risk of brain aneurysm, like increased blood pressure, uh, polycystic kidney disease, fibromuscular dys dysplasia, 
another more rare uh, syndrome. Now, what I'm discussing about here is secular aneurysm or berry aneurysm. There's other kind of aneurysm that are fusiform aneurysm, and there's other aneurysm that are mycotic aneurysm that come from an infection. Obviously, those, uh, those uh, kind of aneurysm are a little bit different in the sense that one of the treatment as well for uh, mycotic aneurysm, obviously, is antibio uh, antibiotherapy uh, to make sure that the infection is treated itself. It runs a little bit in the family. If you have one person that have a berry aneurysm in your family or another person, your risk increase uh, a little bit. Now, how does it show? Does it show like a headache, like a Saturday morning after you had a big Friday evening, you have a bit of, you wake up with a bit of headache and all that? Is it concerning? No. Headache for brain aneurysm, people describe the worst headache of their life. It start all of a sudden, it's like somebody hit them with a baseball bat, no headache, boom, worst headache ever. And a lot of time, depending on the intracranial pressure, people could fall into a coma uh, or have uh, other sign associated with it. So you could see here a large, uh, an aneurysm that rupture in the uh, temporal lobe. Now, before the 1990s, the main treatment option was clipping. Uh, it was a good option, but you'll see the endovascular therapy has evolved quite a bit, and it's now the main uh, way of treating brain aneurysm. Now, the treatment was simple, finding the aneurysm. You could see here the cell pouching there does not belong there. And you just put a clamp at the base there. Uh, and then this way there's no more blood going into the aneurysm and the aneurysm is not at risk of bleeding anymore. We're getting quite good at this to try to minimize our trauma to the brain. But every time we open the brain, there's still things that could happen. Uh, we're developing a way to cut the bone of the orbit. So instead of pulling on the brain, we go under the brain uh, to limit the trauma of that. Now, this is a middle cerebral artery aneurysm, and you could see we're quite delicate, at least I like to think, you know, we're not pulling on the brain and all that, and we're looking uh, to find uh, the aneurysm to put the clip on it. But every time that you do brain surgery, sometimes, you know, people will come and say, you know, they're do people look like they're going good, but they're a bit elderly, and the family will say, you know what, grandpa's doing good, but his memory is a little bit different. So even if the surgery went as well as you can, there's sometimes something a little bit different, and it's really frustrating for us because there's really nothing at surgery you wish would have happened differently. There's nothing different. It's just sometime we don't belong there. And this is a, an interesting book from Fran, Frank Bertozic, uh, who was a resident in Pittsburgh in neurosurgery, who, in fact, after his training, decided that neurosurgery was not for him and decided to become a psychiatrist. Uh, but... In his book, he put few rules, and the rule number one is really uh, good. Is you ain't never the same when the air hits your brain. Yes, the good Lord bricked that sucker in pretty good and for a reason. We're not supposed to play with it. The brain is sort of like a 66 Cadillac. You had to drop the engine and that thing just to change all eight spark plugs. It was built for performance, not for easy servicing. And the same is true for the brain. Uh, again, sometimes things could happen. So... That being said, if there's way that are less invasive, I'm the first one. If somebody's telling me that they're gonna crack my skull open uh, versus you know puncturing my groin or my wrist, I'm gonna sign up for the groin puncture. So there was no doubt as well as the field was evolving that uh, th there's no doubt that it was there to stay and all that. Now, initially, uh, people would say, you know, Coiling, that seems fancy, this technology thing, but this is not, this is not gonna work. Uh, you know, th th this is not as definitive. I'm sure it's not helping the patient. There was obviously a lot of doubt about this because clipping had been going on for a long period of time. So the first study, which was comparing both, was called ISAT. And ISAT was looking at patients who could be treated both ways. So there's still a lot of patients who could not be treated both ways, but patients that could be, be treated both ways People would flip a coin and they would get either clip or coil. And what it shows is that at one year, patients who were treated with coil or endovascular treatment had 23.9% uh, higher chance of being independent. So the outcome was better uh, when people would coil and clip. Now, does it mean we call everyone? No. Uh, we're calling more and more aneurysm. We're treating more and more aneurysm endovascular. And you'll see why, because we have way uh, more tool than we used to. But it still depends on particular situation. Some patient uh, uh, aneurysms still are better tailored for clipping. 
Uh, it depends on how the patient look. It depends of the age of the patient sometimes. It depends of the patient and family consent. Some patients, uh, interestingly enough, have strong opinion versus clipping or coiling. So all that needs to be taken into consideration. One thing is sure is that when we look at microsurgical uh, technique, where uh, the progress is really linear. So uh, it, it's not really disruptive. We're just building, we're getting better. Our instruments are getting a little bit better. We're a bit more careful. Our microscope are getting more powerful. We see better. But if we look at endovascular therapy, it's quite disruptive. It's completely changing the paradigm, changing the way we look at, an at aneurysm and deciding to fix them from inside instead of outside. Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, this is just the beginning and you see the speed that those devices are available. It's dizzying to some extent. So what is a coil? A coil is a loop of platinum. They come in different size and shape. And basically we just go within the aneurysm and we put those loops of platinum within the aneurysm. So this way it put the band-aids within the aneurysm itself and it prevent the aneurysm from bleeding. Now this is an example of this. You could see a large basilar aneurysm. Those kind of aneurysm were the first one that we uh, all agree, I would say, as a community, uh, that it was better to treat them endovascularly because those aneurysms surgically in this location, the morbidity uh, is at least 30%. So it means that you could take someone and you have 30% chance of hurting those patients trying to help them. With coiling, the risk of us hurting patient is probably less than 3%. So obviously, uh, this is quite an advance. Uh, so you can see here the aneurysm has been filled with the loops of platinum and the normal artery fills normally. Now, sometimes the base of the aneurysm is a bit too wide. We could use an adjunct with the balloon. Uh, it helps keeping the coil within the aneurysm. You could see it's an example of that here. And sometimes we copy a little bit what was happening in cardiology. We could use a stent. Now, the problem with the stent is that people need to be on aspirin and Plavix. If people had just a rupture aneurysm, you need to put sometime an external ventricular drain or other thing like this. It's not a good idea for those patients to be on, on aspirin and Plavix because obviously there's tremendous risk associated with it. So this is something that usually we'll, we'll use to treat people that are on rupture, that have aneurysm that are on, on rupture. However, in some circumstances, you'll see that we don't have any other way uh, to go about this and we, uh, we uh, go with the risk of the dual antiplatelets therapy. You could see other adjunct here, a pulse rider, the piconus. Basically, it helps help us support at the base of the aneurysm to try to put the coil in there. Uh, and something that has changed quite uh, the, the scenery of brain aneurysm is flow diversion. So the most frequently employed, and until recently, the only FDA approved was the pipeline. Uh, so basically, it's a tight mesh. So the mesh is really, really tight. There's nothing that could go through that. You cannot put coils through that. You cannot put a catheter to that. It's almost like a screen. So if you, just the, the best analogy for that is that if you throw water to someone, obviously it's going to get wet. If you throw a glass of water through a screen, still water will go through, but it's going to decrease tremendously the speed of the, 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 the that the water was coming at you. So uh, this thing does the same thing. It decreases this the uh, influx of blood within the aneurysm allow the aneurysm to shrivel uh, and slowly the wall of the flow diverter is being um, populated by the, your own cells. So it kind of remodel the vessel and make sure that the vessel uh, become lined and, and uh, does not have this irregularity in the aneurysm. Now there's no two other devices that are not uh, approved. Uh, and this is an example of the pipeline that has not been uh, Photoshop. You could see here, this is the aneurysm. After the flow diverter, a few months later, the aneurysm is completely obliterated. You could see here a large aneurysm that is going in the basal ganglia. Uh, so use both here, put some coil, and you could put, see the flow diverter here. And you could see initially, Amazingly, you could see from that, you get to that. So you could see it really remodeled the vessel. Even the neck of the aneurysm now that's a dead end has completely healed and you could still see flow in the anterior cerebral artery. Another example with another device. And more recently, uh, the web uh, came, which is more an intrasacular flow diverter. So it's pushing, putting a meshing within the aneurysm itself. Uh, you could see here an example, the device is put there 
and it kind of treat um, the uh, the basilar aneurysm. Now, this is it for the theory. Uh, now I'm going to tell you a story. Um, this is on November 8, 2018. Um, this is usually this is a new tendency. That's usually how my, I meet people online, looking at their CAT scan. Some people go on Tinder and those kind of thing, but so. We got a call, this is patient, a transfer from an outside hospital who has, at this point, you guys should be able to tell me here, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this is a young patient, a young adult, uh, and his ventricle here, because of the bleed in the plumbing system and so on, has hydrocephalus. So those ventricles are larger than it should be. Uh, so basically, at this point, we're gathering a little bit more of the story and this is a patient who uh, has an endocarditis, uh, has been on IV antibiotics, and he woke up that morning with a headache, and quickly it became the worst headache of his life, and then uh, he lost consciousness and had a seizure. Uh, this patient arrived, we placed an external ventricular drain, and then we did an angiogram. Now, if you look at this basilar artery, this doesn't look normal here. You could see here there's a slight irregularity here. So there's a small aneurysm here. But unfortunately, there's another problem here. You could see here the opacity here we don't see well. There's clot as well in his posterior cerebral artery at the top of his basilar artery and at the beginning of this cere cere cerebellar, uh, superior cerebellar artery. So this is someone who bled from an aneurysm that we suspect is mycotic. Uh, because of the infection in his bloodstream from the endocarditis, it erodes the vessel. The vessel become really weak. The wall of the vessel become really weak, and there's a little weaker spot that developed there in the basilar tip, and it bled. Fortunately, it stopped bleeding. Otherwise, the person would have been in the 30, 40 percent of people who would have died right away. Now. As he clot this aneurysm, his body probably react, and he has a clot as well within this artery here. Now, I'm looking at it, and at this point, this is not a good situation. Uh, if I go there to remove the clot, obviously this clot is most likely holding where the spot that it bled. So if I go there and remove this clot, probably will, will make the patient bleed and the patient will die there. Obviously, this thing does not belong there, and obviously we know he bled for something. But at this point, looking at it, there's really nothing I could do, which is really uh, difficult to accept. It's a young patient, and at this point, sometimes the best thing to do is to stay put. So we decide to wait, hoping that the clot would go away and then give us the chance to really address the aneurysm. Obviously, not a good idea. We could not really put him on heparin to help the clot go away. So we just uh, put him in the ICU, make sure everything is stable, and again, hope for the best. Fortunately, things are going relatively okay. A few days later, to make sure what's happening with this, we repeat the angiogram. Now, interestingly, you could see things have changed quite a bit. I told you this is a mycotic aneurysm. The wall of the vessel is quite uh, eroded. So you could see here, this thing is quite fragile. Now, how could I fix that? We talk about coil. If we go ahead and put coils in there, that's not gonna hold. You could see there's no base. If I put balloon there, that's not gonna hold. And the other thing, I'm quite worried because the thickness of this wall, it's probably just like wet paper. It's probably really, really, really fragile. Clipping uh, this aneurysm, it's an area that is extremely high risk of clipping, the basilar tip. But in a situation like this, it is quite possible that if I arrive there and try to put the clip, the clip won't hold. It's going to be like trying to clip wet paper and the thing will just uh, blow and, and, and bleed. And unfortunately, that's going to be fatal. So at this point, I decide uh, after discussion with some colleague um, and we, you know, we kind of bounce a different idea and we decide that the safest thing to do at this point was to put him on dual antiplatelets. And uh, the external ventricular drain had been in place for a little while. And we put coils here. I put coils here in the aneurysm. Uh, every time taking picture and, and, you know, envisioning that, you know, maybe I would see blood uh, spilling everywhere. 
considering that it is really fragile. And then we put what we call a pipeline, a flow diverter. So I tried to use those two technology to try to get the best of uh, both world, trying to redirect the blood flow and trying to seal what has bled. After this, looking quite decent, still a bit of blood going at the base of the aneurysm there, but quite happy considering what we're starting from and feel quite confident. Uh, hopefully, you know, this patient, uh, you know, dodge a bullet and things will be uh, smooth. Now, decide to repeat imaging. Uh, this is the follow-up imaging. On what's happening when people have subarachnoid hemorrhage is that people could develop vasospasm. So the vessel could clamp down. You guys, most of you guys are well aware of this. And sometime in younger patient, it could hit pretty bad. So in November 18, uh, there was clinical changes and we, could found that we found that he had terrible vasospasm, pretty much involving all, all his blood vessel. So with medication and balloon, we reopened those vessels. Uh, you could see this is before, this is after. You could see the caliber of the vessel is much better. You could see here it's quite narrow. Uh, after that, it's kind of uh, back to a, a normal caliber. So um, at that point, while we're treating the vasospasm, we re-image the basilar trunk. And what I thought was looking pretty good initially, you could see this mycotic aneurysm uh, came back with a vengeance. So the part that has coil in it, you know, is, is pretty much sealed, but there's a, a lower part that extends toward the superior cerebellar artery that is now quite enlarged. He has spasm at this point. It's not a good idea to think about doing any other thing for that. Hopefully uh, after a few days when the spasm uh, abate, we could see what's happening with this and decide what we're gonna do. November 20th, got a call from the nurse telling me that there's pure blood coming out of the EVD. I don't remember the exact number, but I think it was 50 cc's. And uh, you know that there's something bad happening. At that point, his CAT scan had no more blood. The blood has all resolved. And now significant drainage of blood. And you could see now this is the repeat CAT scan. Fortunately, the EVD kind of saved him from high intracranial pressure. Uh, but we brought him back to the angio suite, and you could see now, this is not going well. This thing is completely dysplastic. Now this is the superior cerebellar artery. So it's a different vessel that has completely uh, enlarged, and we don't have access to that. You remember when I told you about the pipeline? Obviously, we use the pipeline to try to fix that, but the meshing on the, the pipeline is tight. So we cannot bring anything there. Otherwise, I could just go and put loops of platinum there and fix that and block that artery. But we don't have access anymore to that area because of the pipeline. Uh, so at this point, what other tool do we have? Um, I remember uh, Ricardo, my partner, was uh, in town. I think had left for a meeting. And Ricardo uh, you know, did the angiogram. And then we were on the phone talking, you know, what could we do? And both of us come to the conclusion that, you know, there's not much we could do other than putting another flow diverter, hoping that by increasing the meshing, we'll decrease the amount of blood or the speed of blood going to that, and that eventually it's gonna heal. But again, we rely on the body for that happening, and we're not gonna have an acute treatment of this aneurysm. November 22nd, things again, seems like they're going uh, back in the right direction. This is obviously looking much better if we compare to the prior images after two pipeline. Uh, the posterior cerebral artery, things are looking quite good, and it seems like we're uh, making progress again. November 25, 28, there was another rupture, the one I just showed you. So again, the vasospasm doesn't know that he already had vasospasm. The clock restart, another episode of severe vasospasm with his vertebral artery, and he's uh, basilar artery being stenotic, angioplasty was performed at that point uh, to open the caliber of that. December 4th, decide to follow up now that the vasospasm is gone before starting thinking about uh, discharge for rehab. What do we see here has progressed. So it's larger than the prior images uh, when there was spasm. So what is the only solution at this point, at least that we could think of? is just let's put another flow diverter, hoping again that we're gonna decrease the flow going to this aneurysm. 
So a third device was placed in, um, and then he was sent to uh, rehab. On January 11, I hear that he's back to the ER, that he had a seizure. Obviously, we're thinking about the worst. Fortunately, at that point, we get images. We repeat an angiogram, and you could see here, finally, we just see the vessel. There's no more aneurysm, and it seems like things are uh, looking good. And this is the follow-up MRA in August of last year that looked good. Now, what I told you here is really incomplete. Uh, just show you about technique, you know, catheter, show you images. And I have to say that yesterday when I was putting that together, I told Jay uh, earlier, you know, things were bad. I had forgotten how bad they were. And it brings a lot of emotion because we care for people. And through all that, the story would be really incomplete if we don't talk about the vulnerability. The vulnerability of the family, of the patient, that suddenly see their life change completely. Uh, the vulnerability of us, uh, of the nursing staff, seeing people every day, seeing somebody who's intubated, who, you know, to those roller coaster of emotion that their life is changed forever, that the plan that they had for their life suddenly is completely uh, disrupted. Uh, it would be quite incomplete if we didn't think about all the care. We mentioned about that earlier. Um, and when I say about care, is the nursing care, obviously. All the, imagine all the um, diaper change that went through all this stay in the hospital. Nobody will ever talk of that. Is it important? Absolutely. If you would have had the ulcer and all that, he would not be here today. All those simple, simple moves that you guys do every day that a lot of the time, at least I could tell you, I don't take the time to tell you guys, thank you for that, but all those things matter. And they matter so much because they make the difference. I'm sorry, and, and you'll see, uh, seeing Jay, how much it makes a difference. The smile, the tech, the, the you know, radiology tech that see people, that make us smile, that could touch them, all that make a difference. And it's really, really important. Sometimes, you know, through the hard work, long hour, uh, feeling that, you know, we're not, you guys are not value for what you're doing. I could tell you, you could take the biggest, biggest satisfaction in what we're doing because we're fortunate. What we're doing, a lot of people will look at the computer screen all day long. They won't have access to people. They want to have access to those human interaction who, then, who, who make what we are and who we are. And at the end of the day, we're all craving for those relationships. And we're lucky in our work that we're able to have a lot of time those connections so deep with those people that are in situations so of, of so much vulnerability. And through that as well, I didn't mention all the love. We see that uh, days in and days out. Family who are there, uh, that are there days and night, helping those patients uh, by their side, you know, just their presence, uh, just their love, just their uh, smile, uh, just, just again, the, the, those feeling that you look and transcend, uh, you know, sometimes you just wish you would be this person for someone else. And sometimes you see those, those uh, family, the way they handle thing. Um, and, 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 you know, I hate to admit, but sometimes I see some people there and I'm like, good, I wish I would, I, I, you know, obviously situation bringing the circumstances, but I sure hope I'll be that present for my family and my wife and so on. So this is what's missing. And I'm really proud to have Jay with us today uh, to share what's missing in his perspective and all that.